A very good day to you and welcome to the program. It's a beautiful day on the farm and we are excited to be with you. I want to ask you a question at the outset. Are you hungry? Hungry? Hungry for what? Hungry for the Word of God. Are you hungry? Are you committed? Are you expecting the greatest revival that this world has ever seen? You are? Well, then you're in the right place. I want to speak to you about food today, food. So we go straight to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and I'm reading one verse, verse 34. John chapter 4, verse 34, out of the New King James Version. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. There's three words there, food, will, and finish. Those three. What is the food? Jesus' food. His food is to do the will of God. 
What was the will of God to bring peace to a world that was going mad? It's still like that. That was what his meat was. You see, his disciples had gone off to buy food from the village, remember? And he'd been speaking to the woman at the well, okay? And when they came back with the food, they said, Lord, we've brought food. He says, that's not my food. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You see, he'd been talking to a woman who was not even a Jew. She was a Samaritan. So number one, Jews were forbidden to talk to strange women. And number two, definitely not to Samaritans. And he did both of those things. He spoke to her. He told her her whole life story. And she'd never seen him before. And what happened? He was doing the will of his father. She ran into the village. She said, I've just met a man who's told me my whole life story. And that whole village got converted on that day. My meat, my purpose, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And when you do that, you are never hungry again. I'm talking to some people here who are starving and you have got more money and you've got more opportunities than most people, but you are starving. Why? Because you haven't found the will of God for your life. Well, by the end of this program, you will find the will of God, and then it's up to you whether you're going to partake or not. Choice is yours. And then to finish the work. Some men that I'm looking at now, and ladies, who started so well. You started so well, sir. You were a great preacher. You were a great ambassador for Jesus. What's happened? Now, well, the cares of this world, Angus, and, you know, I've just decided I've done my bit. You can never do your bit. Did you, have you been crucified? No? Well, then you haven't done your bit. I remember when I just got saved, which is actually my anniversary in a few days' time, on the 18th of February, 1979. I was in the little vestry. It's at the back of the church, in the little church in the main street of Greytown. I was so nervous. It was the first time in my life <laughs> that I was going to preach. <laughs> and uh, I'd only known the Lord three months. Not even. And all the elders, all the, the long white beards and that wonderful people, don't get me wrong. They actually kept me going. They used to sit there and smile and clap and encourage me. I think half the stuff I spoke about was heresy. But they knew my heart. Try and find some of those people. They're worth knowing. But the one old man, they came and laid their hands on me and they started to pray for me. And after that finished, he said to me, son, yes, sir, get in there and do your bit. I've done my bit. As a new Christian, it didn't sit well. I thought, no, you haven't, sir. You haven't lost any blood yet, have you? Have you lost anything for the gospel? But I didn't say that. I respected the old man. But I've never forgotten that. You can never do your bit. So if you've packed up, you need to get going again. Because it's the thing that keeps you alive is when you eat spiritual food. My family will tell you the happiest time in my life is when I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It really is. It's my meat. It's what I do. It's my food. No food. What happens if you don't eat? You die. Literally, many people are walking around today dead. That's right. You're alive, but your heart's not pumping. You need to get back to Jesus. The food is to do His will. What has He told you to do? What did He tell you to do? Nothing has changed. No, no, He told me to go out and preach the gospel. Why are you not doing it? Oh, well, I'm tired. What are you tired of? I'll tell you why you're tired. It's because you're not eating spiritual food because you're not doing the will of the Father. You say, Angus, you've been a bit harsh on us. No, I'm not. I'm pleading with you. When I see people going to hell every day, every day, thousands, millions, without going to a lost eternity, come on, sir. Come on, madam. You've been gifted. Tell them what Jesus means to you. That's all that preaching is. And if you've forgotten what he means to you, that's why you are in a starvation situation at the moment. You're like one of those people in the concentration camps of skin and bone. You've lost joy. You've lost purpose because you're not eating the food of God. Remember, if it doesn't go in, it can't go out. 
You're not having quiet times. You're not spending time with the Lord. When you spend time with God and you eat the Word of God every day, He strengthens you and He gives you a message to bring to the people. I want to tell you something. I'm not sure we have, where we are at the moment, but the office will tell you. I think we're sitting at close on, maybe we've surpassed it, 700 days. We have sent out the thought for the day. I hope you are getting it. If you're not, phone the office. It's for free. We have not missed one single day. I'm talking about Good Friday. I'm talking about Resurrection Sunday. I'm talking about Christmas Day, Boxing Day, and any other day. <laughs> and I must thank the team. They're behind these cameras. These poor guys are going to get up at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning and send them to you every day. We have not missed a single day. Now, you don't have to clap. It's got nothing to do with that. What I'm trying to explain to you is my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do I look like I'm starving? Exactly. It's because I'm eating the word of God every day. If I don't, I've got nothing to say. You need to get back in to the fight. You need to stand up and dust yourself off and get back in there. You've got to finish this job. It's no good saying, well, you know, when I was 30, when I speak to some old people, and please, guys, I'm also old. It disappoints me when I hear guys saying, well, you know, 1965, when we had the, half of the people watching this program weren't even born then. So what does that affect them? I want you to say, what happened to me this morning? What happened to me yesterday? What happened to me last week? That's what people want to know. How are you handling this coronavirus? How are you undertaking since the looting and the arson? What are you doing with your life? Now are we just keeping safe? Keeping safe for what? What are you keeping safe for? Do you know that the time is ticking away? Do you know that? Jesus is not coming soon, we always say. He's on his way, I tell you. It could be today. I see one cloud up there, maybe two. He could be coming on the clouds, and that's no joke. We've got to do the will of him who called us. And to finish, here we go, finish what you started. Now I'm going to say something that's going to affect, maybe upset a few pastors. And I seem to have a habit of doing that and it's not intentional. I'm also a preacher. And maybe a few evangelists. I want to say to you, the most effective way to preach the gospel is not from the pulpit. It's not from the platform. I do both of those things. It's from your lifestyle. That is the most effective way to preach the gospel. I remember when I got saved, a Methodist minister followed me up, a very dear man. He said to me, Angus, the day I put this dog collar on, I lost 95% of my witness with the world. They see you coming and they put away the cigarettes and they put away the whiskey and they put on their best face, but that's not them. But you, you can walk in there and he can have a whiskey and he can be smoking his cigar and he wants to hear what you're going to say for yourself. So the most effective way is not necessarily at all from the pulpit or the platform. It's from your life. I want to speak to the truck driver. So I want to say to you, you can drive that big 30 ton rig for Jesus. Now I happen to know it's not an easy job. I had a seed sower, a 20 ton Mercedes Benz truck. I drove it from here to Kampala which is Uganda, and that's really right at the top of Africa. I know what it's like when a little old lady, bless her heart, <laughs> decides to pull out from a stop street when you're coming down the hill at 120 kilometers an hour, and you hit all the brakes and there's blue smoke everywhere, and the old deer just gives you a wave, <laughs> gives you a wave and pulls out. That is the testing time. What do you say? You probably say, what are you doing? You, uh -huh. you give it away, but you say, bless you, auntie. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's preaching the gospel. We need to live and to walk the talk. Maybe you work in the gold mines. You know, we had a campaign on this very farm here, a Mighty Men conference. We got letters from miners one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Now, maybe you live in America or maybe you live in Australia. I want to tell you the deepest mines in the world are in South Africa. These men go down. It takes them sometimes three hours to get to the bottom. As, one, as my one dear friend, Tommy, said to me, Angus, it's like you're going into hell. 
It's like you're in a sauna. You're sweating non-stop. You're crawling in stopes that are less than a meter high, crawling on your hands and knees with pads on your elbows and your knees to get that gold ore out. Huh? And sometimes it closes, doesn't it, behind you, and then you're in a, you're in a death uh, coffin. These gold miners would be coming up in the cages from their shift, and the next shift was waiting to go down, and they were having revival meetings as the boys were coming up, the boys standing on top were praying for them. They were sharing testimonies. They were encouraging each other. They were singing Christian songs. That's revival. That is the myth that Jesus Christ is talking about. To do the will of him who sent me. There's a person sitting and watching this saying, but all my life I've been waiting for an opportunity to preach the gospel, Angus, but the doors have never opened. Sir, you've got an instant congregation. Just go to the streets, man. And tell people about Jesus. You'll be shocked, pleasantly shocked when you see the response. You don't have to wait for an appointment for, a, uh, uh, for your pastor to die so that you can get the pulpit. Go out to the rugby club. Go down to the, uh, the, the paddling club. Go to the tennis courts. Go to the mines. Get in amongst those truck drivers when they stop. Those guys are exhausted. Take them a plate of food. Give them a gospel tract. We've got some beautiful ones. We'll give them to you for nothing, man. Start in the journey and pray for them. It'll make their day. And they might get saved right there and then. What about that little shop assistant? I'm talking to you, my sweetheart, <laughs> that young girl. Yeah, but I hate my job. It's so boring. It doesn't have to be boring. When you go there tomorrow, put a smile on your face. And when my old wife, Auntie Jill, comes in, say to her, can I help you this morning? What can I show you? Do you know that Jesus loves you? you you've, got, you've got your own church in that shop. That's exactly how it is. It's about food. Feed the people. They starve him to death. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I want to speak to a school teacher. Sir, you have got your own congregation. Yeah, but I guess you want to see these kids. They're driving me mad. Speak to them about Jesus as well. Well, we're not really allowed to. Well, speak to them about eternal life. Speak to them about a creator who made heaven and earth. Tell them some exciting stories. I don't know how many men I've met who've said, my teacher influenced my life. You know that old movie, Goodbye, Mr. Chips? I tell you what, that brings a tear to me just telling you the name of it. You've never heard of it? Well, look it up. It's worth watching. A true story, I believe. What about a sports coach? What about a sports coach? Now, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. Just across the road behind us here, we had a children's home. And we brought up 27 children from disadvantaged backgrounds. In fact, some of these little babies were abandoned in hospitals. They had no relation. We had to give them a name. They had no name. We brought them here, and we brought them up from this size to fully grown. I want to tell you about just one. His name is Sipo. Okay? And Sipo is a Zulu. And Sipo has been playing representative rugby. He played for the Sharks under-21s here in Kings Park in Durban. It's one of the top top provinces in the world, actually. Okay, many, many Springboks have come from the Sharks. Now, he has become a teacher, and he's teaching in a very big school in Durban, but he also teaches sport. And every two, three times a week, he gets all the little boys, under 12s, under 13s, under 10s, and he teaches them how to play rugby. Now, this guy Weighs in at about 120 kilos. He's got legs the size of my waist. And he runs the 100 meters in like 11 seconds. Okay, he's a machine. Now, I want to tell you about Sipo. Sipo loves children. And I want to tell you something else about Sipo. The kids adore him, including my own grandsons. And whatever he says, they do it. Not what the rest of the teachers say. They come around him. They want to be in his team. They want to be with him. His school has just beaten one of the top schools in Durban for the first time ever in history. 
And everybody wants him. Why? Because he is doing the will of his father, which is in heaven. Now he's not a pastor and he doesn't want to be a pastor. He's a professional sportsman. And I want to tell you, he puts his money where his mouth is. And he is doing an incredible job. These little boys come and they pray together huh? before a match. Folks, I want to tell you that the mission field is right where you are at. I want to tell you something else. We've got a rugby team here in Great Town. We've got a, our local town here. And I remember when the Mighty Men conferences were on their go here in the, in, in this, on this farm. We can't have them anymore here because we don't have enough room. So they're having Mighty Men conferences all over the world, as I talk to you. We used to have that, that war cry. Amen! And people saying, what does that mean? Well, that's how the Zulus are. See, the Zulus are passionate people. And when they say amen, they don't say amen from here. They say amen from here because they mean it. And the devil takes a step back. Those young boys from the first team, rugby team, in the Great Town High School, they changed their war cry. <laughs> and they changed it to amen. Eh? Can you imagine trying to play against a team like that? You lost before you started. I'm talking about doing the will of him who sent you and finishing the work. My food, this is my food. Every morning, today, before I even met with you, spending time with Jesus, hearing what he's got to say. Speak to me, Lord. Your servant is listening. You and I need to understand. You don't have to go to Bible college to preach the gospel. By the way, I always said it. I want to say it again. Praise God for Bible colleges. There's a beautiful Bible college in the bush in the eastern side of our nation. And they are teaching students from all over the continent of Africa, from Liberia, Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia, you name it. And these people are committed. An ex-military ex general is the, is the overseer there and his dear wife. I've got no problem with Bible colleges. We support Bible colleges. But some of us don't have the opportunity, and that's what it is, and the privilege to go to Bible college. But we can go to Jesus, and we can keep telling Jesus, uh, people what Jesus means to us. Isn't that right? So we've got no excuses. So I want to say to you in conclusion that today you need to realize you've got to get back into the race. I just want to tell you about two other people before I pray for you. The one man, he probably won't like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> His name is Eric. And Eric started the biggest fast food franchise in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm including Australasia and even Scandinavia. Yes, ever had a Wimpy hamburger? There's an advert for you, Wimpy, for free. Well, he started Wimpy. This man, in my humble opinion, has impacted more businessmen and more people than any pastor I've ever met. And by the way, I have traveled the world and I've spoken and been at lunch to some of the biggest names in the Christian world. But this gentleman overshadows all of them. Why? Because he operates in his gifting. He is a businessman. He happens to be one of my trustees. He is an incredible man. He swims in the Indian Ocean every morning. That's right, he lives on the coast. He rides his mountain bike every day and he is 87 years young. I rest my case. And the other person is a little lady. She doesn't walk too well. She's got a problem with her one leg. Small little lady, her name is June. And I met June on one of my trips to Mozambique with a big seed sower. And she was living in a, a settlement a township area, a very poor area, in a little, small little house, a little bit same size as my one maybe, smaller actually. I don't think she had any amenities in that place, all by herself. And what was she doing? She was translating the Bible from English into the local dialect. And nobody knows about her. I know about you, June. And if you are watching this program, June, God bless you. You impacted my life like you can't believe. I personally support the Wycliffe Bible translators because these people are never heard of. There's another young couple, Americans, in the middle of the Congo. They've been there for years with their little children. And what are they doing? They're translating the Bible 
These are the people who are doing the will of our Father in heaven. And that's why God is feeding them food. My meat, my food, is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. We need to pray now. We need to pray, and maybe we need to pray a prayer of repentance. Yes, some of us are saying, Lord, please forgive me. I thought that you'd overlooked me. No, God put you in that position. You might be a prisoner in jail. What an opportunity to preach to the other prisoners. I've been in jails all over the world, in New Zealand, in Scotland, in Pretoria, Swanee, in Bloemfontein. I'm talking about maximum security prisons. And every single one of those men need Jesus. And they want Jesus. They hang on every word. Don't go yet. Please stay with us a bit longer. Let's do it. Please pray with me. And maybe you'd like to pray this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I repent. I've hung up my guns, but I'm putting them back on today. I'm taking my Bible and I'm getting back in there. And I'll go wherever they will hear me. And if they won't hear me in one place, I'll go to where they are and where they will hear me. I want to finish the work that you've called me to, just like our master did. And I thank you for the strength and the grace and the fire that you'll put in my bones because I'm going to eat good food from today onwards. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there we have it. Now you know what you have to do. You have to take your Bible and you have to get out there and do it. Where, Angus, wherever you are placed by God. And God will honor the Word. Until next time, God bless you and goodbye. The glory of you, Lord, let it rain on me. Put your hand around me, hold me tight. Whisper in my ear. Savior, my King, I bow with bended knees before you.
Lord, pour.